hope your dream is not that is not a dream. Okay, can we mention a in the comment section? Please mention a car brand that you know. Just type it. Any car brand that comes to your mind. It can even be more than one. Um, please put it in the chat section. I'll be looking at it. Queen, I've seen your introduction. I see Nissan, Toyota, I see Ford. Thank you. Lesson says Benz. Any more Lexus? Lexus, it also says Lexus. BMW, Acura, yes. Anybody else? Dodge, I don't know that one. Matrix, I don't know Matrix. Okay. Range Rover, awesome. Now, usually when I do this session, especially in in person trainings, one of the brands that people list the most is Toyota, especially like for us in Nigeria. Now, if you see from the next slide, these are examples, and this is not a representative um, sample. There are even more car brands, but these are all usually like the most popular, or should I say the ones that are in people's faces. So Mitsubishi, BMW, Honda, Hyundai, um, Mazda, Toyota, Volkswagen. Now, in answering the question, the one that came to your mind first is what you type out. Now, some of you didn't even remember some of the brands that are on this screen. Some of you did. There are also other brands that are not here that people don't remember. And that's why brand positioning is important. Um, I think that one of the most popular cars in Lagos, at least, because I've learned that it differs from um, the different um, states or the different um, sections of the country. But in this part is, is literally the Toyota Corolla. And it's one of the popular brands that you would find and you would see. And why this is important is that what do people remember when they want to buy a car? What do people remember when they want to patronize a business in your industry? So the lady that um, has a fashion business, do they remember you or do they remember another kind of fashion brand? So I want you to hold that thought while we continue. All right, the next question is, mention a soft drink brand that you know. Any soft drink brand that you know. Some of us are addicted to soft drinks. So I'm looking at the chat section. Thank you, Victoria. Victoria says Coca-Cola. John says Chiquita, La Casera, Pepsi. Thank you, Samuel. Chapman. <laughs> I like that, Amulola, actually. Mirinda, thank you for that. Seven up. OK, fantastic. Usually. The brand that takes the most mentions is usually Coca-Cola. So either Coca-Cola, Fanta, Sprite, but that's usually one of the most popular. Now, obviously there are many more um, soft drink brands, but Coca-Cola usually takes the, the big pot, Pepsi. And then more recently, how many of us are aware that Biggie is giving Coca-Cola a run for its money? I mean, this is not a brand strategy class. I love dissecting the strategy in the cola words, but Biggie gives Coca-Cola a run for its money. Whether or not it's a better brand or it tastes better is a different conversation. But in terms of market share, Biggie is now beginning to have name recognition within the Nigerian market. And finally, mention an instant Google brand that you know. This one, I think we'll probably all say the same thing. Instant Nodo brand that you know. Indomie chicken. <laughs> I heard someone say Indomie, yes. Indomie is like the most popular. And I didn't even put anything afterwards because I was researching Golden Penny, there's Chiki, yes. There's Mini Me. I don't know how many of us have tasted any of these other brands, but when you go to the shop, do you say I want instant noodle or do you say I want Indomie? What do we say when we go to the shop? So, so we say Indomie and others, I love it, says it. <laughs> When you go to the shop, do you say, oh, excuse me, do you have instant noodle? Or do you say, please, I'm looking for Indomie? Most, I think almost everybody here says, I want Indomie. Even if 
for whatever reason, Golden Penny is your favorite Korede. Thank you. I was kind there rather. Thank you. Blessing says yes. Even if Golden Penny, for whatever reason, is your favorite Indomie brand, or see, I just said it again, Indomie brand, is your favorite instant noodle brand, you're most likely going to say, I want Indomie. And they are going to bring you Indomie, even though you mean something else. And that's what brand positioning is all about. Where you become the top of mind for your consumer, the top of mind for your category. And we can think about this thing in different dimensions. So detergent, more likely than not, you're going to say Omo. That's one of the first things that comes to your mind. Is Omo the best brand, best detergent brand? It's arguable. There's, there's Ariel, there's Sunlight, although Sunlight is really trying now. But how do you go and say, oh, give me Sunlight as to mean detergent? Omo is taking more categorically to mean detergent. Sunlight may be a better brand, but Omo is what sticks. To Omo and yes, Omo and Clean. Thank you for that, Queen. Um, Oh, somebody can't hear. Praise. Uh, maybe you want to log in and, and, and log out and log in again. So that's the thing about brand positioning. Now, if you think about different brands, what comes to your mind first? What comes to your mind when you want to go and buy tissue? Um, someone talks about St. Louis sugar. That sugar never, you know, that brand, they never advertise or anything. But when you want to go and buy sugar, you think about them. I think Dangote brand, please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think that Dangote brand also has sugar. But hardly do you go and say, oh, please, I want Dangote sugar. You're looking for St. Louis, you're looking for that blue pack. And if you don't see that blue pack, you already assume that that supermarket does not have sugar. But there may be other super sugar brands. I'm not aware because I only buy St. Louis sugar. That's the only sugar brand that I know. So this is why brand positioning is very, very, very important. How do you stick out? How do you stand out? Especially when you're in an industry that is saturated. So someone mentioned real estate. Somebody mentioned fashion. Those are industries or fashion, I wouldn't say real estate is saturated, although you have a lot more people beginning to play in that space. But fashion, there's so many fashion brands. And there's a fashion brand that me, I swear by, because when I go on their Instagram page and I go to their website, what I ordered is what I received. You know, I, they avoid, I've not, I, I've not received stories that touch from their brand. So I always use their brand. If somebody asks me, if I recently, maybe like, Last weekend, my brother called. It was that place you're always buying dress from. One of my friends, she's looking for a dress. And I gave them the person's name, the, the brand's name. And then she bought from the place. Is it the best brand? Maybe not. But that's the brand that sticks to mind. And so we're going to really be discussing why brand positioning is very, very important for you. Now, what are the benefits of a strong brand? Um, oh, well, Queen says Dangote Sugar is the only brand that I know. That's very interesting. Wow. I didn't even know that Angote Sugar was popular. Okay, so benefits of a strong brand. So iPhones, it says that iPhones aren't the most advanced phones, but they are known as a status symbol. Now, if you ask the people who use iPhones, they swear by Apple. You cannot tell them anything. You're addicted to it. Now, is this phone the best phone brand? No, but then Apple has convinced us that iPhones or whether it's the Mac or whatever products that they're selling, as long as you see this, Apple logo, they have convinced you that it is the best. They have convinced you that it is for the most uh, creative and stylish. And they have convinced people that it is a status symbol. Same thing with Toyota. Toyota has this vibe of safe, reliable, and for us here in Nigeria, affordable. So usually people's first cars would usually be a, a, a Toyota. I did, uh, for my master's last year, I did, I did an interesting research. And people said, look, I will go for a Toyota. It's durable. It's affordable. It has a very great secondhand value. But when I blow, I want to move to another brand. So when I blow, I want a Lexus. When I blow, I want a Range Rover. When I blow, I want you know a, a Range Rover. Now, Toyota has high range or um, high priced cars, luxury cars in its fleet. But people don't usually think about Toyota in terms of luxury. They think of it in terms of affordability. They think about it in terms of resale value, secondhand value. And you can correct me if you have other opinion about this, but that's how people usually think about Toyota. McDonald's is a global brand, fast food brand. They don't sell the best burgers. I mean, I've eaten McDonald's a few times, but they're fast and they're cheap. You know that if you want, and I, I can say that the equivalent of McDonald's in our own climate is Chicken Republic. If you want quick, you know, affordable food, that is, how much is, how much is there with well now? I know it has increased, but food that will satisfy your hunger and you won't have to waste time, you're most likely going to go to a Chicken Republic. Is it the best food? No. Is it the, 
the you know the presentation and everything is it the best no but it's cheap it's fast and you're most likely going to go and use it and same thing with starbucks you know they're known to make people happy and i can go on and on with different brands how many of us here are addicted to coca-cola I like asking, Refuel is 900. Ah, and there was a time when Refuel was, what, 500 or 600. Anyway, it's, it's the economy of the time. For those of you that are addicted to Coca-Cola, if I should ask you, why are you addicted to Coca-Cola? You will not give me a rational reason. And I've tried this with so many different people and so many different groups. They think they have a rational reason. If at the last time I did it, I did a training last week. The person said, I can't just explain it. Coca-Cola just gives me a feeling. That sound of shh. When I open it, it's all in your mind. But Coca-Cola has convinced us that you, you need to have a bottle of Coke when it is hot, when it is sunny, when you are outside. But is it really true that that's the best? Water, cold water can do the same thing that Coca-Cola is doing. <laughs> John says, it's the feeling for me to. Mercy says, I'm not addicted. Mercy, good. You and I both. But people say it's a feeling. But what is this feeling? If we break it down, what is, what is, what is inside Coca-Cola? Water, cola, and sugar. What kind of feeling is it giving you? But, you know, you've, this brand has sold you onto this thing. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just trying to open our minds to the psychology of branding because it is psychology. And that no matter where you are, Pepsi doesn't give you that feeling. Biggie Cola doesn't give you that feeling. It must be Coca-Cola. And that's where you need to get your brand to, where it has to be John's brand or nobody else. So that even when you say you are sold out, even when you say you are busy, they say, you know, your, your audience, they will say, oh, we are going to wait for you. And it's very, very achievable, even if you are just starting. What I always tell people about brand building is it takes time to build a solid, good brand. How many of us know how many years that Apple has been in existence? How many of us know how many years Coca-Cola has been in existence or Toyota? These brands did not start yesterday. They did not start 10 years ago. You will be so surprised that some of them started in the 1800s, in the 1900s, and then you know they've lived for centuries. If you go and do your research on this brand. So all of these things I'm talking to you about, I want you to have a long-term perspective and a long-term view to it. You're not just going to implement the steps and then oh, all of a sudden you have a great brand. You have to keep working at it. And can I tell you something? Even the greatest of brands, think about your favorite brand today. Let me, let me use an example. Let's even use iPhone, for example. If you love iPhone, if you're committed to iPhone, do you know that the minutes that iPhone begins to malfunction, maybe they start you know, doing funny things, maybe the phone begins to crash, it's always getting hot, it's not performing. Do you know you're going to switch your loyalty? How many people agree? If consistently over time, iPhone or Samsung doesn't deliver on the value for which you bought it for, you are actually going to leave it and go to another brand that functions. So performance is also very important, which means that brand building is a continuous process. It's not something that you say, ah, yes, we are the best brand in the world. Let us go to sleep. You keep working on it. Coca-Cola, if you know how much they spend on advertising every single year, you will say, ah, for Coca-Cola, you're known worldwide. You are a market leader. Why are you advertising? Because they have to keep on holding people's attention. They have to keep on delivering on their brand promise because they are competitors, because the landscape is different. So for you, in thinking about your brand, you need to think about the following things, the look and feel of your brand, the logo. When people think about branding, they think about logo alone. It is not just about your logo, but your logo is an essential part of your branding. How, what does your logo look like? When I see your logo, what does it communicate to me? Then you're also looking at your content, your promotional literature. How do you communicate this brand on different channels? And we're going to be looking at that in, in a few slides. What is the personal experience of your brand? Now, how many of us have seen a brand online? You like their vibes online, maybe Instagram. You know, it's very cool. It's very nice. And then you say, oh, okay, I want to engage with this brand. And then you maybe on WhatsApp, you click the link. It takes you to the WhatsApp. And the customer service person was absolutely rude. Or maybe you decide that you want to pay this brand a visit. So you go to the brand, you go to their location and store. And then you're wondering, ah, ah, is this the same brand that I saw online that is very cool, that is very kinny? And then the, the customer says, like, yes, what do you want? Or the person is very rude or is very distant. And then you're going to be like, ah, ah, that is this the same brand? The disparity, the personal experience, that is something that happens a lot with Nigerian brands where 
the perception they have given online, the perception they have given to the public, it's not the same thing when we interact with you. Our personal experience is really, really part of branding because that is what will make somebody say, to their friend or to their family or to their colleagues, this is a good brand because their experience matches up to what they see about the brand, to what the brand says about themselves. So that personal experience is important. Social media, your website, for those of you that have businesses, please have a website. I always say this, how many of us, you know, have experienced WhatsApp when it, it, it went down. It's never a funny situation. In fact, it almost feels like there's a mass exodus or the world is coming to an end when ex um, um, WhatsApp comes down. Recently, if you've been following the news, Elon Musk just bought Twitter and Twitter is drastically changing. Everything is changing about Twitter. So if Twitter was your primary mode of operation or interacting with your client, what happens if Elon says, you know what, I'm not doing this Twitter thing again. I'm going to shut down. What are you going to do? Instagram, for a lot of us, Instagram is where we do our buying and selling or where we promote our business. If Mark Zuckerberg and Meta, they have been having downsizing and you know, laying off of people. If they say, okay, it's no longer profitable for us to run Instagram and WhatsApp, what are you going to do? So that's why your website and added to your website, your newsletter is absolutely critical and you must pay attention to it because that is what you own. That is what you can use to consistently stay in touch with your, with your customers and your consumers. And that gives you data as well. We're living in a time where data is literally gold. And with data, you can make decisions. With data, you can know, oh, people are not happy with this service. People are not happy with this product. So make sure that you are connected with your target audience and not just relying on social media because anything literally can happen with social media. And the next thing is products and services. What products and services do you offer? And are you living up to the brand expectation? Remember, I spoke to you about performance. If I'm coming to patronize your brand and you tell me that this brand is going to do X, Y, Z, when I buy the brand, I expect that it gives me X, Y, Z. I expect that this brand is not going to give me issues. I expect that if I buy this product from you, if it's a hair product, and you say this hair product, use it for two months and your hair will grow longer. Best believe that by two months, my hair had better grow longer. And which is why you must not promise what you cannot deliver. A lot of brands do it. So you have a lot of brands saying we're the best, we're the first, we're the kinicon, we're the that, but they don't deliver on that brand promise. And then your customer service, which is tied to the personal experience that people have. How do you relate to your consumers and your clients? How do you speak to them over the phone, via email channel? If they reach out to you today via email, are, they, are you going to respond next week or are you going to respond in a timely fashion? All of this implements on your brand. And in word of mouth, what are people saying about your brand? Are people promoting your brand? Are people telling other people about your brand? So these are the things, the ingredients that are essential in building a strong brand. And like I said before, it is a consistent, constant thing. It's not a one-off. It's something that you will continue to work on, continue to get feedback on, and continue to improve on. So let's talk more about positioning your brand. The first thing is thinking about the purpose. Now, for a lot of us, when we create a business or when we start a business, usually it's because we need an extra source of income. Usually it's like, oh, you know, I need money or, or it, it seems like a good idea. But when I do strategy sessions with brand owners or people that have businesses, when I get them to do, because this, I do it as a, as a full day session, I realize that a lot of them have not really thought deeply about why they're doing this business. And you need to know your why, because that's one of the things that will make you stand out. So what is the purpose? Why does this brand exist? So if I'm in real estate, for example, what am I trying to do? What am I trying to achieve? Is it that, okay, you know what? I want to bring a solution to the housing problem. I want to make it easier for young people, for millennials and Gen Z's to begin to own a home. Or I want to eliminate the negative experiences that people have when they're trying to rent. Why does this business why does this brand exist? You must know the purpose. You must be able to articulate the purpose because that is what you're also going to put in your brand story that connects people to your brand. And then you're going to be looking at your territory. What space do you want to occupy in this competitive landscape? That's what's your unique value proposition. If today you wake up and say, you know what? I want to launch a food business. I guess we all know that the food industry in Nigeria is highly saturated. Every time I go on Instagram, I'm always so amazed. Ah, this is another restaurant another business, another this. And I'm always intrigued as to why are there so many food businesses? But the truth is that even though it is a competitive and saturated space, 
people are always going to eat. So you're going to have to ask yourself, which territory do I want to occupy? I don't know how many of us know this brand on Instagram called Firewood Rice. I really, really study her brand because she puts out information by 8 a.m. and by 11 a.m. sold out, sold out. And you check every time I check the comment section, people are always crying. Oh, I didn't get food today. Oh, it's sold out. Does she sell the best jollof rice? I don't know. I guess that's, that's depending on people's preferences and people's tastes. But she has done something right. She has occupied a category and a niche that she satisfies the needs of her customers, whether it's in terms of the quality of the food, whether it's in terms of the ease at which they're able to order it, whether it's in terms of, oh, partnership with organizations to do daily lunch. She's done something right. So you need to ask yourself, what is my unique selling proposition? Why should people come to my fashion brand? For example, the fashion brand that you know, I was talking about, I like them because they do very nice you know, designs. And if I order today, best believe I'm going to get my order tomorrow. No stories. Like, I don't know how they do that thing. No stories. And they deliver. And then the quality, obviously, is very great. So why are people coming to you? Are they coming to you for the quality? Are they coming to you because your brand makes them feel confident? I told the story about uh, one of my favorite makeup artists. I love her. Like, if you can talk about an addiction, it's how nobody else. And there's so many makeup artists um, around. In my opinion, she's the best for me. Why? Because when I go there, she gives me an experience. And when you speak to her about her brand, she's telling you that, look, I don't, it's not makeup that I'm doing. I bring out the confidence, the inner confidence in women. I make them look like queens. And from the minute you step into her makeup store to relieve, you feel like a queen. You feel beautiful. And so it goes beyond, oh, quick makeup and out. Everything about the experience, the interaction with her staff, the vibes that you get. I'm sold on her completely and totally. And I'm not here to market her. You can see I didn't mention her name. But that is a territory she has begun to occupy. So somebody can say to me, well, are they doing, eh, you know, everybody is doing this business. What can I do differently? You can do something differently in the service delivery. That's what this lady does. She does makeup, but the way she delivers the makeup is so different. The attention to detail, the way she listens to you, it's, it's so fantastic. And that's a unique selling proposition. You can find the same thing. And that is what will bring people to your brand. And then your reason why, what is the unique characteristic that you're offering and that helps you to deliver your brand promise? Like the example that I just gave you, she's giving a whole new experience, an experience that boosts confidence, an experience that just makes you feel like literally you are a queen. So what is your own unique characteristic? And you must be able to define this. This thing takes a lot of work um, to think about. But if you do it well, you're going to have a brand that will make you stand out in, in any saturated industry or audience. Then the functional benefit. What is the key benefit that people are going to get from this, you know, from the clothes that I make, from the accessories? There is, there is an accessory brand that I patronize. It's cheap, it's affordable, uh, and I like it because, again, I'm someone that I lose accessories a lot, earrings, whatever accessory it is. I always lose them. So I hardly buy very expensive jewelry because I have it at the back of my mind that I can misplace this thing. But what this brand offers me is affordable earrings that don't, they don't fade off. I mean, I've used her for a year now and they're still, they're still okay. I can use them. But if I lose them, I mean, they're like 2K, 3, 5, 4, 5. If I, if I lose them, I'm not going to lose sleep. Or like, well, if I lose white gold or rose gold, um, necklace or something, I'm going to be like, oh my God. And then I convert the amount that I bought it to Naira. And that's what she offers me in terms of functional benefit. What are you offering? So it's not enough to say, oh, we are cheap, we're affordable. Beyond that, because there will be someone that will be cheaper than you. There'll be somebody that offers more affordable things than you. But beyond that, what are you, what need are you meeting in your consumer's mind? And this is where you put yourself in your consumer's shoes and say, what are their pain points? Another example I can give you, another makeup brand, I mean, minimalist when it comes to makeup. I don't, I mean, there was a time that my makeup expired, especially the, during that lockdown when I didn't go out. I don't like all the fuss of put this, put foundation, put concealer. I just think it's absolutely unnecessary. And then I, I, I stumbled on this brand, also somebody I went to school with. And her value proposition is the makeup brand for the minimalist woman. And I was like, what? You know, that really caught my attention. And she just says, put three, four puffs, I rub it on your face and you're good to go. 
I said, hmm, interesting. And then I tried it out. She even sent me sample products. I, I, I ordered for one and she sent me, you know, a lot more than I asked for. And honestly, that brand is literally a minimalist, you know, makeup brand. Because I literally only put four, you know, I, I don't know what it's called in makeup terms, but I, you know, squeeze the bottle four times. I rub it on my face. And for the whole day, I kid you not, I'm very good. I was like, she delivers on the value. So that's a functional benefit. Emotional benefit. A lot of you that drink Coca-Cola and are addicted to Coca-Cola, you are emotionally addicted to Coca-Cola, even beyond the functional benefits it's doing in terms of quenching your thirst. And what is for you that emotional connection? And can I say to you that people believe that they make rational decisions, rational purchase decisions, but at large, human beings, we are very emotional. So that's when you're, you're, you see somebody defending your brand. If you see people defending Coca-Cola, and I say to them, but you realize that Coca-Cola has a lot of sugar. You realize that Coca-Cola is not good for your body. And they say the most common thing I've heard, but something will kill a man. But they're so you know, tied to this brand. And that's where that emotional connection comes from. How are you connecting with your end users, your buyers emotionally? Very, very important. So let's do an exercise. I've spoken for a long time. So let's do an exercise. I want you to, and you can please write it in the chat section, to describe your brand in three words. If you could describe your brand, what you do, whether it's real estate or, you know, your fashion, food business, you sell perfume, whatever it is that you do, describe your brand in just three words. Let us start with that. The other two you will have to think about it to answer. That's what is your promise to your customers and what is your unique selling point? If you think about your brand, if you think about what it is you're trying to do, um, how would you describe your brand? And I just need three words. And there's a reason why I'm asking you to use three words to describe your brand. So anybody wants to go for it, please feel free to write in the, in the chat section. I wanna check out the people that, uh, okay, yeah. So Olufumila, you said you have a fashion business. Please describe your brand in three words. Um, Samuel says music business. John, so your voiceover brand, if you could describe it in, in three words, Uduak, Queen, how would you describe, those are the people that answered for, for the business. So um, not for profit organization. Okay, okay, that's, that's, that's not bad. Anybody else? Let me check. Uh, Okay, we have Angela Uluwa. Angela, do you run a business? If you do, could you please uh, share how you would describe your, your brand or your business in three words? We have two Damilolas here. Okay, I see some more comments. Strong, soothing, and relatable. Thank you for that. Um, Samuel says, too big entertainment, energetic, pulsating, reliable. Faith says, happiness, comfort, and fulfillment. Faith, what is this business about? I'm very intrigued with, with the use of um, happiness and, and fulfillment for your brand. Sure, be creative prints, always sure to deliver. I like that blessing. That's very catchy. Someone, some of those music, so energetic pulsating actually resonates with a music business. Faith, please can you just clarify what your business is all about? I just want to, I want, I want to understand the context of happiness, comfort, and fulfillment. Um, Samuel Murray says, unique, classy, and simple. So Samuel, is that, a, is that a fashion business? Sounds like a fashion business. Elegance, taste, and texture. So that's catering, that's food. Okay, thank you so much, Queen. Okay, now these three words are very, very important. Um, okay, so Faith says, food and packages. Okay, so, okay. So happiness, comfort, and fulfillment. Okay, thank you for that. Sandra says fashion house, perfect fitting, mod your shape, you mean model your shape. Um, and then Alakunle says fast, reliable, safe. Alakunle, is that a car brand? That sounds like a car or technology type of business. Damilo Laojo says dazu, sweet, healthy. So from that, I'm, I'm guessing you do healthy foods, granola, parfait, all of that. Victoria says, data direct consulting, customer centric, simple solutions, reliable. Okay, fantastic. I love all the words that we've all been using. And beyond stating the words, and let me use 
Um, Damilola, I'm just going to assume that your business is a healthy food brand. And if, for example, I have a healthy food brand, what are the things that I want people to remember? You know, before I choose the words, I'm going to ask myself, what are the issues or constraints or challenges that people face when eating healthy food? Why do people come to buy healthy food? Because usually people switch to healthy food when they have a consciousness about their health. Maybe the doctor has said they have diabetes or maybe you know, the doctor says, oh, your blood sugar level is high. Something causes that awakening that brings them into, oh, you know, I need to eat healthy. Now, another thing with healthy food is people say, oh, it's very expensive. It's very expensive to keep buying these parfaits and juices every single day. Another thing they say is, oh, it doesn't taste as great. Recently, we switched to almond milk in my house. And my brother is like, I'm not doing this. I'm not interested in this. It doesn't taste nice. The thing when I actually doesn't taste as nice as what a dano or a pig, a pig milk rather. But it is healthy milk and I'm going to drink it. And for those that are lactose intolerant, that is your best bet and your alternative. So I think about those constraints. So then I think about what is the value proposition? What is the word? that I want people to communicate or I want to communicate to people when they think about my healthy brand. I want them to know that it is tasty. I want them to know that it's good for you. So good for your body, perfect for your body, perfect for your gut, because a lot of people have gut health issues. And I want them to know that it fits within their lifestyle. So, you know, a healthy brand for all lifestyle or a healthy brand for a healthy lifestyle, a healthy brand for the woman that's on the go, for the busy woman on the go whatever it is, but you can see how I've tied you to the pain point so that when they think about, oh, I need something quick, I need something affordable, I need something healthy, they are actually thinking about my brand. Um, Queen says, I'm not too good in decorating my cake, but the taste and the texture give me my clients. Hmm, that's very interesting. And I say it's interesting because, for example, if I'm a first-time customer and I go on your Instagram page, Queen, it's the design that gets me first, right? before I knew that it tastes nice or it doesn't taste nice. So I like that you said that your clients, but I want us to think beyond your clients. If the decorating is not so great, how do we emphasize the taste of your product and the texture in the way you communicate your brand so that people will know that this is great. But beyond that, I would also encourage you to also work on the decoration because you know people love to post, for example, um, pictures of their cake so you can't just say, oh, the texture is great. You also want to show people that, you know, the, the visual, you know, is also great. Kamala um, Kuzi says, oh, right, right, okay, got you. So that is why it's really important for you to think about what words do I want to associate with my brand? If we think about Indomie, we think about instant, and that's why it's called instant noodles. In what, 10, 15 minutes, maybe 20, if you do want to do Orishi Rishi Indomie, your Indomie is ready. Is it satisfying? I guess people say it's satisfying. I never really found Indomie satisfying when I used to eat it. But maybe if you do that, maybe it's satisfying. So you think about what do I want to associate with my brand? And that is what you must begin to communicate. How do I want people to think about my fashion brand? How do I want people to think about my cake business. So my cake business, I want people to think about taste. I want people to think about luxury. I want people to think about texture. Whatever it is, you must be able to def def um, defend it. Okay, Victoria is giving a suggestion. And then what is your promise to your customers? Your promise to your customers for the queen that has a cake business is, look, you're going to take this cake and everyone that eats it is going to be wanting more. This cake is going to be one of the highlights of your event. What are you promising your customer? Cake, you know, that you would always remember. Cake that you would dream about. I mean, I can go on and on, but what are you promising your customers? I remember the, the previous slides where I was sharing that your brand promise, you must actually deliver on the promise. And then what is your unique selling point? So you must also think about your brand values. If you do research, and I've done this research, one of the most common brand values that you will find are or two rather, not just one, integrity and excellence. Like I've done this thing everywhere. If I just, even last week, I was doing a review with some people. Integrity and excellence. And then you see the brand that says excellence is our core value. There's nothing excellent about the brand. So you need to think again, what are our values? And your values is why, one of the reasons why people will come to you. So you have them in three layers. 
So you think about what is necessary for my category. So if, for example, you're in the fintech space, if you tell me tr you're trustworthy, that is necessary for your cat category. I'm not going to put money in your fintech, or if it's a fintech that, you know, you're saving, if you think about the carry right, the piggy, piggy vest, I'm not going to put money if I, if I don't trust that when I need my money, I'm going to get it back. So that's what basic means. It's necessary for your category. So anybody in the food business telling me, you know, um, health conscious or standard, of course, you must have standard. I don't want to eat your food and I'm, I'm fully sick or I, you know, I have food poisoning. So that is basic. The next level you need to think about is valued. What is relevant, but it's not enough to differentiate you from other people. So if you take the cake example, if your value is, is, is something that focuses on taste. If your value is something that focus, focuses on um, quality, let's use quality because taste is not a core value. If, if your value is on quality, I expect quality, right? I value it. Now, while it may not differentiate you, it's something that I expect from you. And then your spike is what is going to differentiate you from other people. Attention to detail, it will surprise you how many businesses do not really pay attention to detail? You know, responsive to your consumer. So somebody said consumer centric in the words that they use. Think about those things in levels. Don't just put um, brand value just because it's nice to have. Put it because it is actually what you are promising your, your clients and your customers and you actually deliver on those values. So think about the top three or four things that matter most to you in your brand, in what you are building, in what you want to achieve and then work on incorporating that into your brand story and into your brand element. So crafting your brand promise. A brand promise is a statement. It's a statement that you know, you're know you going to deliver on, or it's a statement that draws your audience to you. So for example, Chicken Republic, you pretty much know that you're going to get affordable food. The day that you go to Chicken Republic and something is costing 10,000, you're going to be like, ah, Chicken Republic, what's going on? To do your brand promise, you need to think about what differentiates me from other people. If you're an NGO, what, what is the thing that is different? What are we doing differently? What are we saying to our audience, to our target audience, our consumers, that makes us stand out from the others? And there's always something, even in a saturated industry. It's just that you need to really think critically about it. And then what is the point of connection? Point of connection to your audience. Um, Queen has said, for example, is the taste. You know, so you emphasize the point of connection and the point of differentiation in your brand promise. And that is what is going to win over your target audience. Remember, what we are talking about is positioning. You want to become top of mind when they say, what is the best tasting cake in Lagos? What is the best um, um, dressmaker in Lagos or Nigeria, or wherever you, know, you are in the country? You want to be able to be top of mind in, in the mind of your, of your customer. And so you think about the points of differentiation and you also think about the points of connection. And then you also think about how do you want to come Yes, so I think her network okay. is frozen. It could okay. be an internet issue, yes. Yeah, so while we're waiting for her, okay, yes, I think it's her internet. So while we're waiting for her, we could um, have two people. Okay, she's back. Oh, she's oh back. sorry. The internet bumped me out. Let me. Um, are you able to see the slides? Yes, please. Yes, we can. Yeah. It's really very, very essential. Your website is going to let people, you know, or let you rather give you the insights and the analytics that you need to make certain business decisions. And then you think about your social media handles. If I go to your social media page, I won't be able to do a social media audit for you today. But is it representative of a good brand. This is a brand that I'll be happy to patronize. You might be good at what you do, but if externally I'm not seeing it, I'm not seeing the visuals are not nice, maybe your pictures, they are blurry. It just does not speak well. And everything, and you may think, oh, it's not fair. Why should you judge me on the quality of my picture? I don't know you. 
and I'm going to judge you by what I see. So if you if you put something there, or if you if you're a fashion brand and you put an outfit that is creased, you're telling me that you're not paying attention to detail, and that is problematic. So your social media handles, your content, it must actually be very, very on point. It must communicate that you know what you're doing. It must communicate that you are a good brand that people can patronize. And then you're also looking at SEO. For example, if I Google best cakes in Lagos, cake, uh, cake, uh, cake maker in Lagos or cake brand in Lagos, will your brand come up? And, you know, it takes a lot of work to get it, but that's something you want to do because people search Google for some of this information. Do you come up? Um, last week I was doing, doing a training. Someone was talking about modest um, uh, fashion for Muslim women. And we did a Google search and there was a brand. It's not a very popular brand, but she has great SEO. Absolutely fantastic. All the necessary keywords. Her business came up, business location, Instagram handle, everything came up. That's something that you want to do because that's what will give you visibility. So work on your Google SEO, work on content marketing, work on your digital advertising. So what kind of ads do you do? Now, I will tell you not to put so much emphasis on digital advertising because people do not like ads. And these days, you know, Instagram, social media platforms are changing their algorithm. I'd rather that you work on content marketing. And what is content marketing? You put in a content that is valuable to your target audience. So if you're making clothes, for example, you can decide to put out other content on, you know, garment care, for example, you know, style tips, other things that bring your customers to your page, as opposed to just it being buy, 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 buy. What else am I coming to see? What is, what is that value? Because that's what will make people stay. Remember, we're talking about differentiating factor. Your differentiator factor might be the tools that you give your consumers. The aftercare, there's a particular brand Although I'm always disturbed by them, but I love the fact that they are always checking in. Are you enjoying the product? Are you having any issues with the product? And they're quick to make replacement if there are issues. Absolutely fantastic. That's something that you may want to do. And if you have the money and the budget for it, influencer marketing. But you also have to be very strategic about influencer marketing so that it actually delivers on the value that you want it to have. Like I said, these are things I can talk on for the whole day, but I just want to give you a good summary of what you should be looking at. Your website and your social media and Google are things I really, really want you to pay attention to if you haven't been doing so thus far. And then you need to define your target audience. The most common thing I hear when I do brand strategy session, oh, we are here for everybody. It's not possible. You cannot be targeting everybody. The most love, um, item of food, bread. Fit farm people have a thing against bread. I don't know if, if some of us follow this brand called Shredder Gang and they've started to do this um, breakdown of calorie content in different things that we eat, in soups, in swallows. I'm like, who sent these people? But the truth is, you cannot be for everybody. Everybody cannot be your target audience. So you must be clear on who you are targeting. Now, in branding, we have two sets of target audience. You have your bull's eye target audience, and this is absolutely the person I want to reach. Then you have your secondary target audience. There are other people, they're not your primary target audience, but other people that can patronize your brand because even beyond your main target audience, you will find that other people are targeting or going to come to your business. So for example, if you say my target is women, um, millennial women, you might find that men that want to buy stuff for their wives, their girlfriends, their sisters, will patronize your brand. You may find that older women or younger women are going to patronize your brand. So those will form your secondary target audience. But you need to be very clear because that will help you in your communication. That will help you in your strategies. That will help you in your promotions and campaign. Christmas is coming. How do you want to position your brand to make sure that when people are thinking of gifts to buy, when think people are thinking of experiences, cake, for example, we are in the season where people are literally going to be looking for cakes. How do you position yourself so that they remember you, they come to your brand? And so this is this um, graphic here is just a quick way to think about your target audience. You have their personal information, the age, gender, hobby, location, interest. Income is important. If you say, oh, you're for the middle class, then that means that they must be earning such an income for them to be able to afford your product and services. You think about the challenges. Don't create a business that you have not factored in the challenges that your audience has or your target audience or your consumer has because you're not going to be able to communicate them to them properly. So you think about the challenges. 
What problems are they trying to solve? What's stopping them from achieving their goal? What specific pain points do they have? And how can your business solve those pain points? Because that is what will come to you. So if you remember the makeup example I gave you, minimalist. She saw, see, I'm going to be using that lady. And thankfully, I'm not even breaking out. That was another issue I had with certain makeup brands. Very, very good value proposition, light. She delivers on it. And I will continue to go because she understood. She was, I think she really did her research well. And she's not trying to promote to everybody, but the minimalist person. And even those that don't even do minimalist makeup, they're actually beginning to use her makeup because it's actually very good. What are their professional goals? And then how can you help? How does your product meet their needs? So voiceover, for example, how, do, how are you meeting their needs? Is it a training need? Is it a need for... Um, for your services, how are you meeting their needs? What are the questions that they are asking? Social listening helps you to know what people are asking in your particular industry or category. And then you can tailor your business to begin to answer some of those questions. And does your ma language match their language? You know, And this means, so they, they, are, they are saying something, but you're saying something else because you're not exactly aligned with the needs that they have. So think of, use this, um, these four metrics to think about your target audience and have your bullseye target audience and know exactly what it is they need and begin to communicate the benefits of your business. So I may have a fashion business, but I realize a challenge for my audience is made to measure that fits them or fits a body type. Or if you say plus size, for example, and that is what I communicate, plus size that is stylish, plus size that is fit for you, you know, plus size that is comfortable. And I begin to communicate that as opposed to say, oh, you know, we're the best. We're the, you know, nobody really cares that you're the best, but they care that you are the best for them and for the particular problem that they have to solve. And this is also why consumer insight is important. Talk to your consumers, talk to people. Why are they buying from you? So um, for example, I'm trying to think of someone, a health food brand, why are your customers buying from you? Why do they patronize you? What's the, your products and services? Is it meeting their need? What are they doing with it? Um, how do they make purchase decisions? There is this brand, this red cup. When it was first created, it's a disposable cup, but it's now synonymously used in, in artist videos and synonymously used with alcohol brands. They did not create that plastic cup to be an alcoholic cup, but they realized that people were using it to drink alcohol. And for some reason in music videos, that cup was always popular. And so they had to you know, change something about that brand, about their marketing to wholesale, to people doing parties. But when they created it, that was not what that cup was for. It was just meant to be a disposable cup, but the usage was different. So how are people using your product? How are they using your, how are they using your services? And what need is it meeting? And then how do they make their purchase decision? Did they come to you when they absolutely have no money or you are the first choice? You know, there's some brands that we patronize. We don't have money. We know that this is the brand I go to when I don't have money. This is the brand I go to when I don't need stress or I don't want any stress. This is the brand I go to when I don't have any other choice. Where do you fall? And you need to know that this is very, very important information for the purposes of positioning. And just quickly as we, as we wrap up, and it's already one o'clock now, digital communication. Digital communication is a very, very critical part of brand building in today's world and in positioning. And these are the typical stages that your audience will go through. Awareness, they need something, they need a dress, they need perfume, they need a car, they want to change currency. How do you make them aware of your brand at that stage? So these are word of mouth, for example. So for example, I would say, oh, do you know where I can change money? That you know any place that has a good rate? I'm likely to call my friend. I'm likely to go on Google. This is why I said Google SEO is very important. By the time they go on Google, and they ask their friends, they go, they go to the consideration stage. So they've seen so many other businesses and they begin to open their websites. Mm, this one looks credible. This one, mm, this one, okay. What are people also say? They're looking at reviews. So you see reviews, videos. So imagine, for example, by the time they click on your page, you have other useful information. You have information that helps them to believe that you're credible. And then they make that decision to actually purchase. So they, they make a booking, they go to your website, they come into your store. Remember, we spoke about experience. So the service that they have, you know, what is the experience of the service? What is the experience? And then post, after sales is not something that we do really great in this country. People just order and, and you forget them. 
But after sales, thank you for purchasing. Some people now, when you order from them, they put a very nice, lovely note. And it's just a nice touch. You just check in. Hope you're enjoying the earring or the clothes that you bought. You're, you're constantly checking in. Doing all of those things, giving them offers, you then make them loyal to your brand. Remember, you're not the only brand or business. And then you think about how do you convert a one-time person into a loyal person and then move them from loyalty because sometimes some people want to make it their best kept secret. But how do you move them from loyalty to advocacy where they are telling all of their friends about your brand? You have not even paid them. And some of us, we do it for certain brands. They've not paid us, but we advocate for Apple, Coca-Cola. They haven't paid us, but because we gain satisfaction and benefit from this brand. And so you're sharing reviews, they're sharing recommendations, they're asking people, you know, they're sharing on their social media pages. And that's where you need to get to. Some brands where you patronize them, they say, oh, please post, please tag me. I don't have to do that. I've paid you. But if I really, really enjoy your product and service, I would actually do it. You wouldn't even have to tell me. But because I really, really liked it, I'm going to actually promote. And that's where you want to get to, where you don't even have to ask them. They're the ones posting about you, telling their audience about you, talking about the experience, maybe wearing your clothes, being in your makeup store, or whatever business it is that you do. And then the final layer is your content. Honestly, think about your content really, really critically. That's something that will really bring people to you. The type of content that you have, valuable information that answers their needs and meets, solves their problems is what you need to think about. And so there's so many ways, videos, you can do um, how to post, just get creative. You know, um, for a fashion brand, I was saying to her, you know, do, do a behind the scene of the process you go through to create, because I saw her ideation process, very detailed and very thorough, and that this will be good content. And people would then know that, ah, this person, she paid attention to detail. This person, is, she's creative. And you take people through the behind the scenes of creating clothes, a, a piece of item, an outfit, or whatever it is. And then you use infographic, use visuals. You can decide to write blog posts, opinion pieces. But you need to really, really think creatively about your content because content is really, really what drives visibility of your brand. It's really what communicates the benefit of your brand. And it's also what endears people to your brand. And so in thinking about your content strategy, you want to think about who is going to be reading my content? What problem am I solving? So very, very important. What problem am I solving? What content formats do I want to focus on? Do I just want to do videos? Videos, if you feel, oh, it's more expensive. Do I want to do short clips? Do I want to do infographics? What do I want to do? Or do I just want to use text? What channels do I want to publish on? Aside from Instagram, do I want to do YouTube? Definitely your websites. I would always advocate for you to use your website. And then how would you manage the content creation and publication process? Do you want to do it yourself? A lot of business owners, because they're overwhelmed, they're not able to create the content themselves. Would you get a freelancer? Do you have enough money to be able to engage you know, a, a consultant to be able to work on it for you? And then how will you measure progress and success? Very, very important. Everything that I've told you about, you need to be measuring. Measure your activities on, on Instagram. Measure the content that you're putting out. Is it bringing value for you? Is it bringing um, people? Is it bringing awareness? Is it bringing interest? And you need to be able to measure it because that's when you know this is working, this is not working. What do I need to change? What do I need to improve upon? And just to wrap up as a takeaway before I take your questions, do a brand audit to look out for inconsistencies. And a brand audit is you're asking your clients or you're asking your customers, what do you like about the brand? What can we do better? From those information, you would then find out if there are inconsistencies. So, for example, they may complain about, oh, the last time I ordered, um, the, the, the product was tasting funny, or it didn't, you know, maybe usually um, it stays up to two weeks, but now after a week, it got spoiled. You need to be able to do a brand audit. When you think about my brand, you know, what comes to your mind? That's a question you need to be able to ask your, your customers, or even in the public, you can even do an Instagram poll. What do you think about you review your operations and your customer experience. Is it hard for people to make a purchase? Are you one of those people that you say, oh, sorry, I was sleepy. Oh, sorry, I, I, you know, um, you, just, you just ghost them, when, especially when they've paid. Are you know Nigerians? When they've paid for something and they can't reach you, they become agitated. So is that you? What is the experience? Is it very, very tedious to get in touch with you? Um, think about it, review your operations because it also feeds into your brand. You cannot build a strong and good brand of bad services and bad products is not possible. 
what you then find is that people are constantly complaining about your product. I mean, think about some of our Nigerian banks. I mean, there was a tweet a few days ago that it said a particular branch should focus on decoration, another branch should focus on, on, on fashion because they're not delivering on their actual value proposition. So, and if you don't deliver, people are going to talk about it. People are going to complain. And then you must also communicate strategically across all channels. Make sure that you're strategic about your communication on Instagram, whether it's LinkedIn, some people now are using TikTok. Do you have to be on TikTok? My answer to you is if it's important for your business, if your target audience will be there, then by all means, you can be on TikTok. And then engage in social listening regularly. Google your business, Google yourself. You know, I always tell people, you need to find out what is, what is there about you on Google. If you try it now, some of you may be very surprised. Google the name of your business on Twitter. Even though Twitter is going through, is going through its unique changes, do hashtag your business name or just put your business name on it. You'll be so surprised at information that you didn't even know, but you must be doing social listening, not just for your business, also for your industry. What are people talking about? What are people, what do they want? What are their complaints? What, I can, what, what can I do better? You know, so that my brand is delivering on all touch points and in everything that my consumer expects. So that is the end of, of the conversation today. Mm -hmm.